Hello, hello. Welcome back to Women of Color and Confidence. I am your host, Amber Rose West. Thank you so much for joining me today. I had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Carol Parker Walsh. She is an executive and leadership coach helping her clients showcase their brilliance and design an epic career and life that matters. Our conversation today was full of so many amazing antidotes and really just resonating through the message of women choosing the life that they want, the life that they want for themselves, the life that they want for their careers, the life that they want to be living for their dreams. Dr. Kara Parker Walsh has been the go-to coach for Grammy Award winners, Paralympic gold medalists, and Fortune 500 leaders. And we talk a little bit about the mentality that these people had while they were in the process of becoming such decorated and successful individuals and what is going on in their head might surprise you a little bit. You might hear a little bit of what also is going on inside of your head. This conversation is so deep yet funny, fun, light. Um, and I really was honored to be able to sit down with Dr. Kara Parker Wash today. Um, so let's go ahead and get into her interview. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, great. I really love everything about your story. As I was reading through what you were sharing and what you wanted to talk about today, I was really impressed is probably the best word I came across. Oh, wow. Thank through. you. Yeah. You seem like such um, a remarkable woman and that you have such amazing stories to tell. So having you on the show was uh, the second I read your questionnaire, I was like, yes, that's happening. I can't wait to talk oh, to wow. Dr. Carol. Um, so I would love for you to just introduce yourself to our listeners and give us an idea of who you are as a person and um, what you do. Yes, well, I was born on a rainy sun. No, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I so what I do is I am an executive coach, personal branding strategist, and life coach in a lot of ways for midlife, high achieving professional women who are at the place in their life where they're in the midlife pivot and are looking to find more meaning and value in the work that they do in the world so that they can leave a legacy and an impact. I mean, that's what I would summarize what I do. And my journey there really was to create this practice was through my own experience. So I was an employment and labor attorney specializing in employment discrimination litigation in Chicago for a lot of years. And um, that wasn't quite the right fit for me. You know, I, I to be in a field that was just primarily adversarial was just a value disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, I loved helping people. I went into it to help people, to right the wrongs and defend the little man, if you will. But, um, you know, the field is so adversarial and it's just not my nature to be that way. I'm much more mediative. And so when we would get into mediations or settlement agreements, I like would soar there mm -hmm. because I always was looking for the win-win for people and not just to be in it to fight. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of got burnt out out just on that because I found it just wasn't aligned for me. And then I moved into, um, actually I became a director of HR, helping to really build some HR functions for small companies. And um, then went into organizational consulting where I thought, well, maybe I can go in organizations and help them not be sued so mm -hmm. they can perform better. Mm -hmm. And um, did a lot of team development, executive coaching, um, you know, work group development processes, training new leaders, emerging leaders, um, and helping them really be the best that they can possibly be. And that prompted me to want to go back to school. So I got my doctorate in uh, human development and organizational systems and moved into academia and started teaching and, you know, directing programs and running programs and creating uh, programs around leadership and leadership development and things of that nature. And then I moved up the ranks in academia as um, an assistant and associate professor, then directed programs, then became an associate dean. And then I was in a massive car accident, actually a near fatal car accident. Mm -hmm. And um, that shifted everything for me. And a few years before that, you know, I had finished my doctorate, I got a divorce. So there was several life changing things that were popping in that were causing me to really rethink a lot of things in my life. And but that car accident was so pivotal for me. 
because, you know, if the drunk driver almost hit me head on and had he hit me head on, I would not be here. Mm -hmm. And I was in a wheelchair for six months and had multiple surgeries in the hospital for a month and just like really recouping and, you know, having a lot of rehab and walking again and things of that nature. But the thing that helped me to survive that accident was that I was on a two lane road the options on either side of me were not optimal, right? It was either mm -hmm. off the side of the cliff or into oncoming traffic. Mm -hmm. And I heard a voice as clear as if somebody were in the car with me sitting next to me to say, turn now. Mm. And I, for a moment, wondered like, where do I turn? But I turned away from the car into oncoming traffic. He hit the passenger side, which kind of caved in on the right side of my body, which is, you know, what broke a lot of things that caused the rehab. But I survived. And, you know, he was in this big F5, F20, whatever those trucks are, mm -hmm. and, and he rolled over into the ravine. And even though I took a hit, I survived. And through my recovery, what kept resonating in my head was that voice that said, turn now. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it meta metaphorically that for years, I've been kind of hearing this whisper saying, are you on the right track? Do you love what you do? Should you be doing this? Why are you doing this? You don't really, you don't really love it. Mm -hmm. But that voice turn now felt like it was the big call to say, now is your time, like enough of, you know, the practical excuses of why you shouldn't do this or the fear or the doubt or the risk of whatever the things that were keeping me from actually exploring my desires and goals, it, it stopped from there. And that yeah. just completely changed my trajectory. So I began that path of just really figuring out who I was, what I wanted. Questions, honestly, we never ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I answered those questions and decided to create and design my own path of where I wanted to do next, as opposed to following some pre-described idea of where my career should be or what I should be doing at this age and stage of my life, you know, blah, 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 kind of thing. So it was really significant. And that is, and so after I went through that, I started, you know, researching and talking to other women and realizing they were hearing the same voice, that they were feeling the same ways, that they were struggling with these decisions. And that's when I knew that my calling, what I was meant to do was to really help them to listen to that voice and to step into their purpose. You know, I joke and say, I feel like I'm like the modern age Neo, like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm out there freeing, <laughs> freeing minds from the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> that, that your, your story resonates with me so much because I very similarly had a car accident that changed the trajectory of my thinking and the way that I felt about life and the action of living in my body and as the person that I am, it just so happened that my accident happened before I made any of those decisions. I was 18 years old. I had decided when I had left high school, well, when I was in high school, I spent three years doing AP classes. So I was doing college courses in high school. You know, I was playing sports, captain my team, had a job the moment I could. And I was so burnt out before I even graduated high school that wow. I made the decision not to go to college right away. I'm like, I've been doing college and I want to just, you know, kind of work and, and, and relax a little bit before I go into what I knew was going to be a very long educational journey. And mm -hmm. in that year, I just got into so much trouble. You know, I just was <laughs> like, I took relaxing to partying to, to the not good places. Right. And, right. you know, my whole family was like, what are you doing? You're like the academic of the family. You're like, there's so much goodness ahead of you. And you're just you're like, Wah. and I was like, you, you worry about you. I'll worry about me. <laughs> like kind right. Of, right. One car accident completely totaled the car. I was bedridden for seemed like six weeks. I was able to move around. I wow. didn't break any bones, but I had severe internal bruising, um, mm -hmm. some bleeding bruises all over up and down my body. Couldn't move my joints, a lot of them. And, you know, laid up in bed, you don't have a lot to do, but think, you know, That's you don't very have true. To do. And yeah. as I was laying there, I just thought, okay, well, you know, it's okay that I don't want to go directly to college, but there has to be a different thing here. And there also has to be a different reason that this car accident didn't do much more damage than it could have. Like I'm meant to be here and I'm yeah. meant to be here. Yeah. And that's exactly how I felt. I felt like, you know, it's weird because I never was angry or mad. I've never like had 
those type of feelings from the accident, it was all joy and gratitude because I felt like, I felt like part of that voice was like, you're not done. Mm-hmm. You know, it's time for you to step into like, what's next. You have more work yeah. to do. And so I felt the same way. And I think it's, I think it's fascinating that for women, I find, I find this now, this is not some, you know, um, statistically proven <laughs> study, mm-hmm. but I do find in conversations that it's interesting to me how for women, it takes some type of an event mm-hmm. to get us to say, you know what, I'm going to change directions and move a different way. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I believe that's fascinating for me is because for men, they just usually decide mm-hmm. and just go for it. But for us, you know, we struggle so much with just saying, I'm going to course correct. I'm going to change. I'm going to do this instead. It usually does take some type of event Mm -hmm. for us to say, okay, now I can. It's like, it gives us permission as opposed to us giving ourselves permission, which Mm -hmm. I think is embedded a lot of confidence and self-confidence, which I know we're going to get into. Yeah. Yeah, we are. I really want to talk. I I love listening to you talk about, you know, work and careers. Uh, One of the things is that um, you help people choose a career by helping them design it and make it like this epic journey for themselves rather than that. uh, I guess I'll do this kind of thing, which is a little bit about a little bit of what you were just talking about. Can you Mm -hmm. tell me like, what's the difference between like finding a career or like, you know, being in a career and really designing one that feels like this epic journey? Yeah, that's a great question. For me, the difference is whether or not it's externally driven or intrinsically driven, right? Mm -hmm. So, so often the way we find our careers is through what other people tell us that we can do, right? You know, we look at outside, you know, books or we watch other people or other people tell us, oh, you're so good at this. You should do this. Or, oh, Mm -hmm. you have a proficiency at that. Why don't you try this? Um, you know, so we follow these preset kind of ideas or other people's ideas and proposals of what we should do. And that's kind of how we fall into a career. And, and I know that personally, because I remember my moving into, you know, even in my academic career, moving from teaching to academic leadership, mm-hmm. I didn't really want to do that. But I kept being told by my dean, oh, you should, you should this, you'd be really great at it. You should think about stepping into the next journey. And actually at the time that I stepped away from it, I was being groomed to like step into a provost position and, and thinking about my career trajectory in academia. And I'm thinking, I never wanted to be, do any of this, <laughs> but I was guided and directed from very well-meaning mentors and very well-meaning friends that looking at my experience and background that this is where I should go. And so that's what I did. And I think most people find themselves in careers that really weren't necessarily designed by themselves. Mm -hmm. The difference when you design a career is that it's all intrinsically driven. It's you getting clear about what you want, how you want to work, what are your value systems and how do you want those to show up in the things that you do? What's the impact you want to create? Who do you want to impact? How do you want to work? What are the ways you want to work? What are the industries that really feel comfortable for you? Like I said earlier, you know, even being an attorney, I realized, well, I'm not adversarial. Like, why am I in a a profession where all you do is fight all day? Mm -hmm. Like, like there's a disconnect there, but I would have stayed had I listened to other external people saying, but you're a lawyer and look how much money you make. It's crazy to walk away from that. Right. And that's what happens. And I could have stayed for 20 years miserable Uh because externally it was validated as the right path and the right choice for me, Mm -hmm. as opposed to finding something that intrinsically drove me and inspired me and motivated me Mm -hmm. to do the things that I want to do and leave the legacy that I want to leave. And so to me, that's the difference between designing something like epic that you can really live and enjoy your life through as opposed to just following a path mm-hmm. and, and the thing you know I, I work a lot primarily with women who are in midlife and the thing that is true is that when women start approaching that midlife that those 40s 50s um they're not so much forward focused on like, what can I accomplish and achieve like we are in our twenties and maybe thirties. When we start getting into those late forties and fifties, we're starting to look back and ask ourselves questions like, 
did I live a good life? Did I do what I wanted to do? You know, have I accomplished the things that I wanted to accomplish? Am I leaving the legacy that I want to leave? Like those are just from a human development lifespan um, cycle. Those are the questions that we start to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what I want more than anything is for women not to live a life of regret and not to be at a place thinking, I wish if only I should have, why didn't I, as opposed to, I did the damn thing. Yeah, (laughs) I did that that thing. I took that risk. I went after what I wanted, even if it shifts and change. And and that's a whole nother mythology is that there's no one job. There's no one thing or one career. It's really understanding the gifts that you decide to bring to the table in the ways that you decide to bring them at any point in time in your career. Mm -hmm. So we have to let go of this mythology that there's this one path, this one way, and that you have no choice in that direction and in that choice and design. Yeah, that's definitely an old story. And I did hear that a lot when I was a kid. Um, And I know that it's kind of a a, a myth that's now kind of being, um, it's fizzling out, which is, you know, you you find the place, you work there, your loyalty for 40, 50 years, and then, you know, you retire and then you're trapped. That whole story is like, we don't live in yes. that world anymore. No, <laughs> we don't. Bit. And we haven't, we haven't lived in it for a long time, but like some women who are old school come from that. It's really hard to shake that oh, yeah. framework from their mind to say that, no, you actually don't have to follow that. You can do something different. Yeah. And, and when you're also, you know, usually at midlife, now you, you have a mortgage, you have kids yeah. tuitions and you have aging parents. So you're literally in the middle yeah. and you're kind of torn between, you know, do I spend time really focusing on me and prioritizing <laughs> me or do I spend the time on the ones coming after me and taking care of the ones who, you know, brought me forward. Yeah. And that's a big dilemma, which is why a lot of times women also just tend to just give in and settle and just ride the wave because yeah. they feel like they don't have permission or that it's a selfish, um, guilty pleasure mm-hmm. to focus on themselves and what they want, which yeah. is again, such a, such a myth and such a, a horrible tragedy to me. Yeah. Yeah. And especially to women who deserve to, to follow these really great big dreams and, and innovations that they have in their head. And, you know, it's really, I, I really appreciate you bringing this up because this is actually something, this exact topic, the not wanting women to look back on their lives with regret because they didn't get themselves into the places that they wanted to be in the years that um, are now behind them. I literally started crying when I was recording this part of my last podcast episode um, about overpowering your insecurities, because I just was Mm. like, one of my, one thing as a confidence coach, when I work with other women and they start talking about, you know, I feel like I wasted time and I feel like, like I just didn't do it when I was supposed to do it, you know? And so, you know, or it should have been done 10 years ago and it's too late. And I'm like, you're 35. What do you mean? It's too late. (laughs) It's not too late. Um, you know, you are echoing what that sounds like for them. If they don't make the changes that are already tapping, tapping on them right now, you know, we all still have time. Um, as long as we still have feet on the planet, as long as we're still, you know, here in our vessel and we have the tapping in our heart and the tapping that's in our heads, that's saying, do this, do this, follow this. There's, there's something there that's going to excite you or bring you joy or fulfill you in some way. As long as you have that, there's always time. And the only thing that has to shift and change is your mentality around it and the emotions that you put into whether or not you follow it or you keep denying it. That is so true. It it really is um, a trick of the patriarchy. I let me just mm-hmm. be really real and honest in yeah. that it's a messaging. We have to be able to unravel and disconnect to the detrimental messages that we get as women, because from a patriarchal perspective, you know, we have a lot, we have a shelf life. Like women have, you know, we're, we're, we are practically done. If you look at any of the media, if you look at anything that's out there, there's so much focus on youth and Mm -hmm. young women. And, and, and when you're in your twenties and when you're hot and sexy, and then anything that's geared toward as you age is always stuff like Botox and cosmetics that make you look like you were 20 Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Or, or having the body that you had at 20, you know, so everything is geared toward like staying in this, this kind of um, youth indulged 
fantasy mm -hmm. as opposed to celebrating that. Are you kidding me? I have so much more life to live in at every stage of my life. It's an amazing wonder in uh, creation and, and discovery that I get to have at every new decade that I have and to yeah. celebrate what that means, but yeah. that's not the messages that we get. And right. so it's why so many of us do feel at 35, 45, 55, that we're done that. Oh, well, now I might as well like, well, my kids, it's the kids turn now. Yeah. So, you know, little, little Sally, I'll just, you know, give her everything that I couldn't have for myself. And that's so not true. One of the things that I have women do is to draw a line across a sheet of paper mm -hmm. and I have to put zero and, you know, a hundred at the end, you know, sometimes 90. Yeah. And then I have them plot, where is your age on that line? And then have them literally look, look how much time is left yeah. on that line for you. Yeah. Like you're not done. Like 36 is not the end. Like, you know, on average women live anywhere between maybe 80 and 90, maybe, maybe a yeah. hundred if you're really good. Mm -hmm. So if you're 35, there's still almost a good 50 years left. Yes. <laughs> even if you're 55, there's still a good 35, 40, maybe even 50 years left. Right. So you know, there's so much more time. Like we're yeah. never too old. We're, it's never too late. There's always an opportunity. Yeah. It's the power. We have the power every day and every year to begin again. Mm -hmm. And I think that is mm -hmm. so such a powerful belief and, and piece of wisdom to hold on to that can just have us do amazing things. In a lot of ways, I feel like I didn't come alive till I was 50. I started my business at 50. I, you know, have been on covers of magazines. I did a TEDx talk. Like my life came alive at 50 in a lot of ways Yeah. because I feel like I'd been on autopilot and just following that preset path for so long. And that accident, like I said, shook everything up. And all of a sudden the world opened up to me and it's been an incredible ride. Yeah. I love that. And it's really interesting to think about that. I like that visualization of the timeline, you know, that line on the piece of paper, because it really does, you know, and I, I understand this because I studied like marketing and persuasion when I was in college, but it's such a marketing tool, like get it while it lasts. It's right now. Yes. You only have so much time to enjoy this. Soon you're going to be too old to enjoy it. <laughs> like that whole, like you're just constantly like, I, I only have so much time. I only have yes. so much time. And you get into that space. Yes. And it really is when you stop, there was, you know, I didn't watch TV. And it's for only like, for women. It's only for women. I know it's for men, it's women. like, life is boundless and endless <laughs> all the time. It's gray men just like riding horses and living their best life. Yeah. Like, oh, but for women, no. It's, no. Oh, oh. I remember when I stopped watching television and I stopped listening to the radio. I did that for like two years. I was like, I kind of shut it out because- at the time I was still in college trying to finish my degree and I was running a business and I was like, I don't have time to have all this outside um, influence mm -hmm. coming in, impacting me in my head. And I remember I, that when I started watching it again is when I started to feel those things again. It was like once I wasn't listening to even just programming, I wasn't listening to television or shows or the little things that they put into their, their writing or, you know, the 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 lyrics of other people's songs on the radio or the commercials and everything I felt better just because it was like well my life I'm doing all the things I want to do and yeah I have a lot of a lot to do and a lot of people to answer to and this research that I'm trying to do like all this stuff but at the same time it was like I felt good because I was there in the moment it was almost also the same as like um, you know, I stopped having so many mirrors around my house all the time. Like I have one in my bathroom. I have one in my bedroom. There is not one in the living room. There's not one by the door, like very minimally. And it really helped me feel better about myself because I wasn't constantly looking at myself in the mirror all the time, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. so I feel like when you stop having that reflection, that bouncing off of information, you really get to tap into what's happening inside of you. Um, yes. I can tell that that's a big part of what you teach. It's a big part of what I teach in, in, in confidence coaching as well, because being able to listen to yourself instead of, you know, don't get me wrong. There's lots of great information out here. There's a lot of like really supportive and amazing things. And I do think that there's a time and a place for a message that's like, Hey, let's think about time a little bit, but this yeah. fear based focused on time is something that I think really begins to dissipate when we start like, how does my body feel? How does my mind feel? How does my energy feel? Right. And then focus on the things that impact that 
rather than, you know, what your face looks like. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with that. It, it's the other reason too. I mean, I know there's been studies that say that, you know, what, what happens to your psyche when you scroll through Instagram, when you scroll yeah. through, you know, social media and things of that nature. And while again, like, like you said, I'm not against those mediums and, you know, I'm on those mediums, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I don't live on those because there's a comparison bias that always creeps in because as yeah. soon as you see someone else's life you're thinking well why don't I do that or why haven't I done that or why don't I look like that or why don't I have that or you know it's it's we don't look at it to celebrate others we look at it to say how horrible we are yeah. <laughs> how far we haven't and come to want or, to want to right want, and to want. to want things as opposed to looking at ourselves and celebrating yeah. wow look what I have look what I become look what I do look who I am look what I'm learning look how I'm growing like we just don't it's it's the weirdest thing that we don't spend enough time with ourselves yeah. to even celebrate or to acknowledge all the amazingness that is within us and around us yeah so true well, you have worked with Grammy Award winners, um, Fortune 500 leaders. I have two questions specifically because this, you know, and even the paraplegic gold gold medalist, it just was like, these are some people who really have to put the pedal to the metal, both mentally and physically into their careers and what it is that they're doing. So I have two questions. Um, but the first one is, I'm curious if you have seen how things like imposter syndrome have come come about in these people that are, you know, these individuals that are so decorated and they have so many achievements. Have you seen things like, you know, the comparison we were just talking about, the imposter syndrome pop up? Um, and, you know, what does it look like as they're traveling through those things in 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 getting to where it is that they're so decorated? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing that I think is true about imposter syndrome is that it impacts the most successful people that much more. I mean, it it really almost is a unfortunately a a disease of the successful. Yeah. <laughs> because because what happens what I've seen particularly with the the higher people go is this fear of was that a fluke? Can I do it again? Mm -hmm. You know, because now that you're up there, all eyes are on you, mm -hmm. all expectations are on you, and you have to maintain. You can't, mm -hmm. the, the star can't dim, right? Mm -hmm. You've already hit that. So it's like, what's next? Mm -hmm. And so there's this internal pressure of having to try to prove that what you originally earned wasn't a fluke because if you don't do it again or if you fall off the pedal or if something else happens then people start to question the original success that you had mm -hmm. and so absolutely the imposter syndrome is was very prevalent in the women I worked with in terms of you know what people thought and how they showed up and you know not wanting to show up not wanting to like you know be out there and tell their story particularly um you know with the uh, the Olympia and the para the para um um uh, olympian that i worked with mm -hmm. um you know was this really this thing about showing up again and and owning her her um, successes and her wins and mm -hmm. but just there was a little bit of fear about but putting yourself out there because she had earned those um uh, medals, you know, years before I actually started working with her. And so, but the pressure and the accolades above her made her feel like, can I go out there? I'm not skiing anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not winning those gold medals anymore. Can I still, am I still great? Right. Mm -hmm. Do I have something really to offer? Do I have something that people would want to hear from me because I'm not doing that anymore. So really like, who am I? Where's my worth now? So absolutely, it definitely shows up, right? And that is the challenge of that happens when your worth is put externally and not internally, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about imposter syndrome is when you think it's because of those things, those awards, those wins, you know, the, that money, that success, when you think those things are the reason that you're great and significant and fabulous, when those things go away, then what's left. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest challenges and dangers I saw when, you know, working, working with people at that level. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too. I feel like, um, imposter syndrome tends to be this quest for 
belonging in whatever place you have then found yourself in right mm-hmm. like i have these medals but is it you know can can i be accepted do i belong going out there you know wearing my medals and talking to these people um and that's truly what i believe imposter syndrome has turned into um you know i did a lot of research on imposter syndrome from the 70s uh, with ames and, ames and kane um and just really understanding that before it was really like you need to be better you know and then you get better and then you're like am I supposed to be here? I didn't realize that I had gotten so good that I I can now stand in this room. And the more I start working with other women who have imposter syndrome now, I'm really understanding how much there is this correlation between feeling like an imposter and then trying to feel accepted and belonging in this new place. And that there's this um, influence of the environment that's happening that makes you feel like you Mm -hmm. don't. And then it goes into your brain that goes into everything you like do and say. But if you allow yourself, you know, that again, that permission, like I, I do belong here and I, I can be accepted here when I first accept myself, accept yes. that I am accepting me. And then I accept that I belong in this place. And then, you know, you hope that you're standing in a room full of other people that also feel, accept themselves and feel like they belong. And then you can just all be there together. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I would love to hear how you have watched or, and even helped these people that are going through, you know, things like imposter syndrome, um, undoubtedly become themselves, right? Become apologetically, I am, and I belong, and and this is what I'm doing. How have you seen their lives and careers shift? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the most exciting thing when I see that take place. And I still will years later have people just like show up on my LinkedIn or drop a message like I'm still celebrating, you know, everything (laughs) that I learned. And I'm so excited that, you know, you helped me to embark on this journey. You know, I've seen it in women who have completely changed careers Mm -hmm. and are doing something vibrantly. I had, I had one client who was, so minimized in her in her role where she was at but also in her own thinking and belief in terms of herself Mm -hmm. and through our work together I remember she said this so beautifully she said I stopped looking for a seat at the table and I learned to build my own Mm -hmm. and um, she left a position and then became the president of a company (laughs) someplace else right she was questioning her value and worth in one company and then once she figured out that it wasn't through the company or needed to come from the company, but seeing her own worth and value in herself, that she became the president of another, another company. I had another client who was, (laughs) she was retiring after 20 years in a particular career and wanted so much to go into a different field, but she thought, well, I have 20 years of experience here. There's no way I could you know, translate my skills or transfer them to something else. And she was able to do that in this thriving, you know, doing policy work, something that, you know, she dreamed of doing, but never thought that she could do. Right. You know, and so there's so many examples of women who are just, who, who, you know, I, 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 one of my clients was ready to like leave her job because she just felt invalidated and not, not uh, respected where she was at. And after our work together, she became, like uh, the right hand of the organization. In fact, they paid her a significant bonus not to leave. They were asking her for her input because she just showed up differently. She showed up with so much more confidence and knowing what she brought to the table and knowing what she had to offer made a complete 180 in terms of how she was there. And so she went from wanting to leave to like basically owning the place (laughs) because she owned her own significance. And because she owned that, they were able to see and validate that. And she was able to, you know, create a work situation that was more conducive for the way that she wanted to live for herself and her family. So there's like stories after stories of women who just once they start to see themselves, it's it's a process that I work through. And the first thing that we do is a praise. I call it a praise. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of like what you do when you go to a jeweler and you have this diamond Mm -hmm. and you want to know what it's worth, right? And they look at all the facets and everything around. That's what I help women do. Like the first thing I want you to do is to see the beauty, all the facets of the amazingness that you bring to the table. Like you have to see that and appraise the worth and the value that you have just by being you. 
not even, we're not even talking about degrees and certifications and job experience. We're talking about you and what you bring to the table and just so seeing that beauty of that gem. And then we go through just amplifying it. How do we show up in understanding that fabulousness? And then how do we create a plan, an action plan to just activate and get out there and go after courageously the, for the things that you want to do. And so we work through that process together and it's just amazing to watch when I, you know, when the women go through it. Yes, that is absolutely amazing. And I love the focusing on them aspect of this. This is, you know, when I ask people who they are, you know, this is actually one of the first steps in my coaching program too. Hey, who are you? And they go, I'm a mom, I'm a lawyer. I like to run. And I'm like, okay, those are all great titles, but like, how does that make you who yes. you are? Like, tell me a little yes. bit more about, you know, the value of being a runner, the the parts of being a mom that have changed you as a person, not that you're just someone's mom. Like there's a part of being a mom that has changed you. So what is that? And what is that? Right. And to see, you know, it's so interesting because I, I think that this is also a part of that shifting away from the, the patriarchal um, influences of women and what they're supposed to be doing all the time. And how they're supposed to look at work and fulfillment um, asking women, like, who are you as a person? If you were to strip away all the titles, you know, like you're not a dentist, you're someone that works on teeth because like, tell me like what that exactly. is about for you. And it's just this whole light bulb moment for them when they realize they've been living for their titles rather than mm-hmm. living for themselves. And I just love, same as you love that process of them going, I've never been asked this before. I don't even know. Like, this is a thought process I've never gone through before. I'm like, what's up? (laughs) Yes, that is, oh, that is so true because, you know, I mean, part of my doctoral research was um, understanding identity development from a gender and racial intersection, right? Mm -hmm. And so- you That's are so awesome, right. by the way. <laughs> well, but 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 what you're saying is so true is that we create these identities, these professional identities or these other identities because we've never been given the opportunity or never thought we had the right to define ourselves for ourselves as mm-hmm. opposed to through what it is that we do. Mm-hmm. And our society is very driven toward that, right? Because the first thing you do when you meet someone is say, hey, mm-hmm. so give me your name and what do you do? Mm-hmm. That's the first thing we ask them is what do you do? We don't ask them who they are. You know, what are you you passionate about? What excites you? (laughs) What gets you up in the morning? Like nobody (laughs) asks those questions. So we don't ask ourselves those questions because we think they're insignificant or unnecessary. And so we pour everything into developing and perfectly curating and crafting these external identities so much so that what I have found working with women in midlife is that they have no clue. And I'm sure even beyond, but they have no clue who they are. When I ask the question, who are you? Or even what do you want to do? like they don't like what do you mean what do I want to do I, I should be promoted I should to the be. next level I was say, right like, like the I should response. be exactly this is what I should be doing or where I should be in my career but when I ask what do you want to do it's so insignificant they think it's not even important or they have no idea because they've never really asked themselves the question or gone into that level of thought process to figure it out or been given the opportunity to you know, and that's, that is one thing that I, I talk about a lot when it comes to confidence is like, nobody, it's not a subject in school. It's not something they taught. In fact, actively everywhere we go, everything we look at is in teaching us how to not have confidence, how to be completely separated from authenticity, from feeling ourselves, from wanting to be confident just in who we are without all of the bells, whistles, outfits, hairstyles you know, titles, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, And that was one thing that when I was first started working that I realized that women are just like, you can do that. How do you, how do you learn how to do that? And I'm like, oh yeah, nobody taught us. They didn't want us to know. Right, (laughs) right. Now we know, now we know. I'm curious to hear how you see, you know, this work evolving into the future like what is the future of this work and how is it going to be continuing to evolve yeah that's a great question so there's a couple things and and I love what you were talking about in terms of you know confidence and finding your own confidence because you know for me I think that 
confidence is a like a past focus, right? It's the things that you've done that now you feel confident in. Yeah. But self-confidence is so much more. It really is this belief in what's possible for you mm-hmm. and a commitment to feel all the feelings. Yeah. To like go to like really lean into every fear, doubt, question, anxiety provoking thing and still emerging and moving through in terms of stepping into what you want to step into next. And so when I think about the future of like this work and even the future of work, I see it very human centric focused. I see us shifting into an acknowledgement that we are human beings, that we have feelings, that we have purpose, that we have passion and goals. I mean, I've even seen organizations when they're hiring people to ask the questions like, what is your purpose? To start asking these questions of people who are applying because they want to see what their goals and ambitions are to see if they're aligned with what the organization can and wants to do for them. I've seen the creation of chief wellness officers who are, you know, looking to make sure that their well-being, the mental and physical well-being, not just well, not just physical, the mental well-being of the people that are working there are being taken care of, you know, these flexibilities in the way that we work and how we show up so that people can balance and find that great alignment, rather, I hate the word balance, actually, the alignment mm-hmm. between, you know, who they are and what they do is really created. So mm-hmm. I really find that we're moving toward a really acknowledgement of the human-centric aspect of who we are. Mm-hmm. And so So that means that if we're moving that way in the future of work, that means you have, you have a great responsibility to start tapping into what that means for you, right? To really connect with, yeah, what that means for you. How do you define it? How do you know so that you're not waiting for others to tell you or to instruct you or to award you or to whatever in your life and career, but that you're the director and the driver of it, that you know already. And so you're sharing that with other people so that they can partner with you and to support your vision and dream. So we have to start with ourselves to get clear on what that means so that when we step into places of work or step into opportunities or create our own economy and business, that we're doing it in a way that really connects to the human piece of who we are, the, the, what makes us the human experience, our humanity, because I think that has been what has been missing for so long. And we are finding, finally finding our way to really understand that that is the center of everything. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's our work. And that's what we all need to be embracing and trying to figure out moving forward. Yeah. I love that you really focused on the, the, the emotional piece of it as well. Because I know that there there can be a lot of emotions and and you know this working with with women who are in that stage of life where they're like, you know, looking back, but also have a lot of time going forward. There's a lot of emotions that can come up with that. And I, one of the biggest tools that I use with my clients is the, the feeling wheel or the wheel of emotion that's from uh, Gloria Wilcox, Dr. Gloria Wilcox. Um, And I, you know, it, it is separated into the one that I use is a version of her original one, but in the middle, there's um, shame on one side, love on the other side, and it's separated by forgiveness, right? And then mm-hmm. between those two, you know, you have anger and frustration. And then on the other side, you have like joy and uh, anger, frustration, sadness, and then you have joy and um, fulfillment, and all these things. But then the the emotions are this big wheel that stem from these things. And uh, the middle is always, you know, forgiveness is the the core, and then you have love and shame on each side, and then every other emotion is spread out from that. And one of the things I try to remind people is that we're going to feel all of these emotions because that's a part of our human experience, but that to allow ourselves to feel those emotions without judgment attached to them. And says to say, if I'm feeling jealousy, well, that's a bad emotion and I shouldn't be feeling that. And I need to put that away. And then I want to, I want to go to the other side of the wheel where I'm feeling supportive, right? But there's a place for jealousy. There's a reason that jealousy is there. And so it doesn't matter where on the wheel you're feeling the emotion. It's about saying and really acknowledging and honoring. I'm having this emotion. Why am I having this emotion? To not judge it and make it mean something about whether you're a good person or a bad person. It's a good feeling or bad feeling. But say I am having a feeling. Now, what's up with that feeling? <laughs> feeling? Yeah, 
Yeah, that, you know, and I was trained um, uh, with a, a, um, a, a cognitive model through the life coach school. And so it's mm -hmm. very similar in that, first of all, understanding life is 50-50 mm -hmm. and that we are going to feel all the feels that don't feel great. And we're going to have all the feels that feel amazing. And the beautiful thing about that is that we know what amazing feels like because we feel the things that aren't amazing. Yeah. But exactly what we need to do is to lean into if you are feeling shame or jealousy or things of that nature, just what you said is that don't judge it. Don't make it mean anything about you. Mm -hmm. that if I am feeling jealous, then I'm a horrible person for feeling jealous. Yeah. What? No, it's a feeling. It's, yeah. it's just a feeling. It's just something <laughs> that popped up. So instead of judging it, examine it. Like, or ignoring oh, it. I'm not ignoring jealous. It. I'm not right. jealous. Oh, like, yeah, that's you horrible, are. right? And so I call that buffering. So what we yeah. do is that when we feel a feeling that we don't like, what we end up doing is making things so much worse because we either try to avoid it or resist it, right? Or ignore it. And that doesn't work. It's like trying to push a beach ball underwater. Like it's going to come out, people. Yeah, <laughs> it's going it, to come up. It's going to come up. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and sometimes it comes out in ways that we're irritable. You know, we start having one more you know, cocktail than we want. We yeah. eat, like we look for other, we watch TV, we zone out. Like we do these buffering activities because we don't want to feel the emotion mm -hmm. and those buffering activities, because we don't feel the emotion. It keeps us from going after the things that we want, or mm -hmm. because we're judging the emotion. It keeps us from going after the things that we want, because we then think of ourselves as horrible people because we actually have emotion, yeah. which are part of the human experience. So being self-confidence and actually going after those things is your acceptance and willingness to feel all the feels yeah. and to not judge yourself for it and to not make it mean anything about you other than in this moment in time, I'm having this feeling. Yep, exactly. <laughs> right. And just like, oh, what I do and what I've learned to do, trust me, because it takes time to get there. I don't want to make it mm -hmm. seem like, oh, mm -hmm. just feel the feels and you're fine. <laughs> but but one of the things that I have my clients do when they're feeling it is I'm like, stop and just ask yourself, that's just be curious. Curious. Like, where did that mm -hmm. come from? Like, why am I feeling that? Like, what's going on? Not judging yourself like I don't want to feel it or not avoiding it, like you said, but just get curious about it and explore it so that you can get to the root of it and understand it and don't be afraid of it. Of it yeah. because once we can feel those feelings and not be afraid of those feelings my goodness that what's possible becomes just widespread and expanded for you yeah I'm glad that you're resonating that message because the last guest that we had on was uh, Erica, the chef, Erica Perry. And she said that was the one thing that she kept coming back to is that, you know, we learn from ourselves. We make habits for ourselves, not through judgment, but through curiosity. And it's yes. so true. So true. Yes. Dr. Carol Parker Walsh, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> this could go on forever. You're, I know, it was awesome. You're so inspirational. And I feel like there's just so much that all of us can learn from you. I'm really grateful to have had you on the show. Can you tell us where you would like people to connect with you? Yeah, well, the first place you can always go is to my website, which is www.carolparkerwalsh.com. And that can take you into a myriad of places. You can also find me on Instagram at uh, Dr. is Dr. Carol Parker Walsh. Or I would love for you to check out my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash Carol Parker Walsh. And I love to drop you know, tips and trainings and some of my podcast episodes there for you to be able to, you know, glean some insights and things of that nature as well. Absolutely. And I'll make sure to put all of those links in the show notes for those of you who are listening and watching. Uh, Dr. Carol, what is it that you would like to be known for? You know, I want to be known again. I feel like I want to be known as Neo. Let's just summarize it as that, but I want to be known <laughs> as, you know, a woman who helps other women to fearlessly and unapologetically step into who they're meant to be in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And all of us deserve a little bit more of that in our lives, no matter what age we are, no matter where we find ourselves being ourselves unapologetically is legit such the way that we should all be living. And I'm here for it. 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much, Amber. This has been amazing. Yay. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I love this conversation. This is like the, this is the thing that I, I want to be getting out into the world. Also, these types of conversations between women and women of color, because they're so important. And I think the more other women of color hear us having these conversations, the more that they're inspired to take actions in their own life. So thank you for spending your time here with me. Um, thank you to all the listeners that, that showed up today for those of you watching we really appreciate you being here i'll be back in two weeks with a fresh episode of women of color and confidence thanks for being here today and i will see you soon bye